Good evening. Welcome back to Broke Cannon. Happy Pride Month. While you're going about your business today, please just spare a thought for the various gays of the universe. Bill Potts. Clara Oswald. Yanto Jones. Ah, not you. Sil. And Dalek Thay. I think this gay guy is working fine. It's never let me down before. And so to celebrate, let's get a fitting fact. Matrix. Bill Potts and Heather, the sentient puddle, lived a happy, long life together. Without bodies, but also sometimes with bodies. You know, for such a friendly, accessible episode, the pilot befuddles my brain. I could not tell you what the actual plot is, because I don't think they really satisfyingly explain what Heather is. Bill just has an alien stalker for 45 minutes. I've heard about wanting people's dirty bath water, but she wants to become the dirty bath water. It might be an understatement to say that Bill Potts didn't get the happiest of goes round. But through the power of lesbians, <clears throat> but through the power of love, Heather managed to take her away from a corporeal body and they floated around all time and space together as a big cosmic puddle. See, that's what Pride Month's about. And this fact isn't particularly shocking, interesting, or even that funny. It's just there to remind you that Bill Potts had a lovely long life. And everything since Twice Upon a Time has just sort of hit that point home. Everybody just collectively wants the best for this companion. Right after the Doctor fell, the two went on a cosmic road trip, as Bill took Heather to all the places that she and the Doctor never got to go to. Like Barcelona, or a good monk story. Paul Connell made a couple additions to his novel of Twice Upon a Time. It stands to reason that the testimony avatar of her would contain all of her thoughts, even up to her final moments. And we know what they are now. The last thing she remembered was Heather standing over her. Heather kissed Bill and cried as Bill died of old age. And Bill encouraged Heather to go back out and continue traveling the universe. Another eternal out amongst the stars. Where she presumably ran into Clara and Ashilda going on their own bisexual adventures. So that's, um, lovely. This time last year, we got to catch up with Bill, played by Paul Mackey. Hey, Nardi. As you know, me and Heather are on a break, and I'm back at St. Luke's. It's a good, positive move, actually. It's not been easy. I mean, you always think you're dating a goddess at the start of a relationship, right? But if they keep on being a goddess, it gets really annoying. Woman got shot in the chest, turned into a Cyberman, died in battle, became non-corporeal, and then just returned to Earth to finish her studies. Yeah, well, yeah, picked the right year for it, Bill Potts. All the time and space, and she chose COVID-19 England. It's a bit tricky down here at the moment, but keeping it positive. She then goes on to tell Nardo about Black Lives Matter. Not to bring the mood down or anything. Sadly, the mini episode does not show us Nardo's reaction. I want to know his take. I want to know what he makes of this. Oh, wait, shit, maybe I don't. It's said that during this time, the two were on a break from each other, which almost sounds sad, but Heather is uh, omniscient. So she predicted the pair would be back together in four months, two weeks and three days. Uh, how does that relationship work? Are they both omniscient? That sounds like the worst relationship ever. Bill just decides at some point she wants to be a human again. Kind of lucky that she can do that. The two of them purchased a home, owned many cats, and grew old together. Yeah, there's no punchline. I just thought it was really neat and nice. Sometimes you need that, right? Stop being so cynical. Fact number two. All right, all right. You know me. You know I'm all about equality. I must have a heterosexual fact around us somewhere. Bingo. Classic series writer Chris Boucher keeps trying to make the British sci-fi series Blake 7 canon. It seems to be the goal of his career. Fun fact, I have not watched Blake 7. I am a 24 year old man. And if you thought I was going to watch four seasons and 52 episodes for this one fact, you have overestimated me today. This is a rabbit hole that goes strangely deep. Not just once this happened, it's an ongoing project, stemming back all the way to the Robots of Death. As far as space operas go, Blake 7 is not the most far removed from Doctor Who. Not only are there shared sets, props, actors, and the BBC's wardrobe department, 
but it was also devised by creator of the Daleks, Terry Nation. Way back in the day, Tom Baker and Terry Nation wanted to do a crossover, with the finale of the second season seeing Blake's crew battling a squad of Daleks. Why not? Why not? Because the BBC have no sense of humour, apparently. Decades later, Chris Boucher would put a fix to this. We can muster a better Blake 7 crossover than Time Lash, surely. And so, in the BBC Books range, Boucher decided to return to his Robots of Death script, and published one of the best received Doctor Who books around. Walking around on the same base as the Fourth Doctor and Leela is Carnell, a character who originated in that TV show. It's the 2000s, literally nobody is going to care. Sorry Nation, your intellectual properties have become a subsidiary of Doctor Who. So a Blake 7 character has met the Doctor. Not as a funny aside, like a face-to-face -face meeting. That's as concrete as it gets. No, I will not be taking questions about the Next Generation comic at this time. I think it's pretty neat. Maybe you don't have a sense of humour. But then it goes one step further as we step into the real niche where characters from this specific novel, this sequel story, get their own spin-off. Caldor City uses the character situations and settings that appear in Chris Boucher's Doctor Who novel Corpse Marker to tell a complex tale of sex, money, and death. I knew Robots of Death was kind of glam rock, but I had no idea. On Pride Month? I dived in very briefly into this series, but I felt more alienated than I have in my life. It's a rough around the edges sci-fi space opera, but beyond that, it's pretty much impregnable. Jesus, Iris Wildtime, Faction Paradox, and how Caldor City does the reading list ever end. Caldor City has many faces that we've seen in Doctor Who properties before, from Iago, who, you know, Paul Darrow, he's the main character, that's Rog. And Ulvanoff. Who's this fella from Robots of Death? If you've ever been watching Robots of Death and stopped to think, what's this guy's deal? What's he really like in his off hours, his domestic home life? Then boom, this is the series for you, I guess. Boucher in general seems to be a very incestuous and self-referential author. Uh, Caldor City has references to Fendal, for God's sake. This man was crafting a fictional universe out of his three stories he got onto television. And honestly, I think he should be admired for it. If I ever became a big hotshot official Doctor Who writer, I would put references to Sooty and Friends in every goddamn story. Hi guys, quick tangent, interrupting my own video just to let you know, perhaps the best broke canon fact so far, Sooty the Bear. He's canon. A good, close, personal friend of one Iris Wildtime. Sooty and all of his friends live in the universe. He had his voice stolen on the planet Metabilis 4. It's a good life. It's a good life. It's a good place to be. And now, an extract from a short video I made on my old Doctor Who channel in 2008. Back to the video! Look at all of the mileage you can get from one culturally iconic and beloved story from the 70s. Big Finish not only have the rights to make Blake 7 stories, but also have their own Robots of Death spin-off series. Because of course they do! This is what happens when we give the slightest bit of praise to an old Doctor Who episode. Someone will make a universe around it, and then all of a sudden, seven seasons later, they're meeting the Paternoster gang. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention, Bernice Summerfield knows of a terrorist cell called Blake Seven, <laughs> which I, could be them. Caldor City does frequently hint that Paul Darrow's characters were the same guy. Also, sorry, I'm just reading now. There was a Robots of Death stage play? Oh my god, there was a Robots of Death stage play! What on earth? Paul Darrow's character, Iago, who we were just talking about, he replaces the fourth Doctor in the story. And the robots were performed by mimes. 
<laughs> oh my god, there's two of them. Ugh, oh, the world just never ends, does it? Bring me the third. The doctor has a dumping ground. And no, I don't mean the power state. Oh! Newsflash, science fiction fantasy rules don't always make sense. Uh, for example, can you travel faster than the speed of light in the future? For the Doomsday Doctor says no, that's impossible, and that's what the entire plot revolves around. Frogman's plan fails because that's just a scientific impossibility. But then that's exactly what they do in Sharda. And the third Doctor conducts his own experiments into this, believing that he can recreate that using only 1970s Earth technology. Einstein's special theory of relativity said, said that you cannot travel in space faster than the speed of light because the speed of light is a limiting factor. If you traveled more than 180,000 miles per second, you'd encounter the time distortion effect. In the Time War, I remember the Daleks had like a thousand worlds and they wanted to throw them all at Gallifrey and apparently that was 50 times the speed of light. So, the rules are bullshit and science fiction rules even more so. How dare you science fiction fantasy authors for not pioneering a new era of science, laying out the law of rel relativity. I think it comes down to how much of a scientific stickler the writer is. Bidmead would be having none of it. The Doctor has complete freedom of movement on the map. He can go anywhere. But what Einstein realized is that we can't have freedom of movement, otherwise we'd run into trouble. Now let's talk about prehistory. Hands up class, how many of you can name a story or a time that the Doctor has gone into prehistory? References something or meet something that existed before the dawn of time. Because just a reminder, the Time Lords did invent time. You can thank the VNAs for that one. We just had an event about it like a few months back. But this also, according to several stories, is impossible to do in verse. Hey, here's a fun game. Go on the TARDIS wiki and type in event one, as in the first event, what started all life in the universe. Just check out every single story that has something to say about it. You've got the Eternals and the Beast and the Solar Tracts. They all existed before time did. Thus, the Time Lords existed before time did. A bunch of different things did. Ragnos, Immortals, Vampires. It's a card that the Doctor Who series likes to play. Things definitely did exist before our universe. The Doctor learnt about it in the Matrix once when he became president. Stars were the shapes of green donuts. So this is interesting, but where's the contradiction? Which scientific rules is this breaking? Well, the Doctor was fine in the dark times, walking around having adventures like normal, but some stories specifically underline the fact that without time, nobody can move. We know this because there are times where the Doctor not once, not twice, three times on the record took an enemy and dumped them into prehistory, defeating them by stripping away time. Doctor Who is OP. The second Doctor tricked the Vist to travelling back before the Time Lords evolved so they could claim ownership of time. This led them to right before the Big Bang, and with no time for them to move across, they got stuck. The 11th Doctor did a similar trick with the Kin, just kicking him out and dumping him in the void before creation where he could do no harm to the universe. Where are all these books coming from? What? I have a lot of Doctor Who books. Where are they coming from? My question. Why doesn't he try this with everyone? Maybe he does. Maybe those are the adventures we don't see. Hey, question. How does the time machine get out of pre-time if there is no time? I'm way too deep in. I'm gonna go have a lie down, I think, actually. I think that's best for everyone involved. Update time. I got full-time work as a video editor. I also got hard striked by YouTube last week, which is why you didn't see much of me. I am a demonetized man. So this video is basically another freebie. If you do want to support the channel, I recently used all of my Kofi money to buy a massive batch of books, so all the money goes back into Broke Cannon. I would really appreciate your help. Until then. <laughs>